Anyway, first of all, cheers, Adam. <laughs> Good to see yes. you. Lovely to see you again oh. after so long. Oh. Oh. And hello to everybody. Um, and well, you can see who I've got as my guest. And if you don't recognize him, then you probably don't know anything about dogs. Um, I came up with a lovely expression to describe you today. The king of canine cognition. How about oh that? God. That's a bit of alliteration, yeah? Um, and the thing is, I, I remember when we first met, you said you used to start by saying, I don't know anything about, I don't even like dogs. <laughs> and then your daughter, Bernadette, got a dog. And you know, and you stopped saying that. You know, now I know something about dogs. Well, um, that's true. But the thing is, there is so much more to you than dogs. And, uh, you know, when I do these things, just so people know, I, you know, we don't rehearse or anything like that. But I do ask my guests always to send me their CV, despite the fact that I know them. Um, there's always some interesting extra little nuggets there. And Adam's CV is so understated. It's unbelievable. So profession, biologist. <laughs> this is this is somebody who, you know, has more citations than most university departments put together in biology, as far as I can tell. Um, you've got 17,000 citations or whatever to your papers, according to Google. Um, just over 200 papers. And Adam has a growing interest in animal computer interaction, but he's also published some really great stuff on zebra um, fish as well. And that's how he started his career. So if you didn't know that, um, so it's a great pleasure. It's lovely to see you again, Adam. Um, it's great. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, no, it's, it's lovely nice to, to see be with you. Again. <laughs> yeah, as I said, it's, it's, as I said, it's one of those things that um, during this lockdown, you just miss having conversations with people um, and sharing as much as I love my family. You know, it's just nice to chat to somebody else. And, you know, I, I love my colleagues as well. But yeah, I miss that. I don't miss getting on a plane, do you? No, actually, traveling is, is uh, really not really the, the fact. Actually, at the department, but we decided to make some little excursions now again. And we went out uh, the seniors, so not too many people that we can talk with each other. And then sort of really, it was a very nice day. Actually, we were lucky it was sunny. And that's helped us a little bit to get together and discussing issues. Because on email, I mean, it's really difficult to be sort of very personal. Yeah, so we've we, with our students, what we've started to do, well, we we arranged to do a number of practicals out on the West Common. So Lincoln has mm -hmm. these two big areas of common land where people can keep their horses and whatever. And so we we decided with lockdown because the university was told that we have to do this. Uh, we, we have to do some face to face teaching, but we wanted to mm -hmm. make it safe. So we thought well, we've got all these horses and dogs on the West Common. Let's take the students out there to go and watch on the West ah, Common. Okay. And I know you've got that big green outside your department as well. Yeah. And it was just so nice to see somebody with legs. <laughs> it's like you, like you'd rather just seeing the top half of them. But um, yeah, it's it is it's weird, isn't it? So yeah. anyway, um, as I said, I don't know where to start, but let's start in the beginning. Um, so. So yeah, yeah, your career didn't start with dogs. It, no. it started with zebrafish and things like that. Do you want to just well, tell, say a little bit of, about that? Well, yes, I mean, uh, it was a very strange start because I always uh, wanted to do something with uh, thinking, with uh, cognition. And then uh, also my professor at that time was interested in this, prof in this, uh, this uh, branch of science. But actually, when I went uh, to the ethology department of that time, everywhere you could only see fishes, and 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 uh, or actually fish. So and it was one species, and that was the it's called the paradise fish. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very upset actually because I was expecting you know dogs and and cats and uh, different birds and ravens whatever. So really exciting um, species, but then that was this only fish, and, and huge amounts actually in aquariums from bottom to the top. But then it turns out that you will, you will, if you like science, and I think if you like to uh, uh, ask questions and get answers to that questions, I mean, it doesn't really matter where you will start. And I think I, it was a very sad day when I really had to leave the fish <laughs> for the dogs. <laughs> so, because there was a, that department decision that, you know, that is the last day or we had to get rid of the fish and then we started to work on the dogs. But uh, so I'm, and then the zebrafish project was a sort of a coming back 
then I had the chance to go to England for this, my some years of as a postdoc time. And then with Professor Richard Andrew, we worked, I think, two and a half years on this fish project. And actually he invited me because he was a bird person. And so he wanted to know or get some expertise from me on how to work on fish. So that, that part of my career was again on fish with a little bit of dogs. And then after that, when I came back to Hungary, then this dog project started basically very specifically in the year 2000 when we started. I mean, we started a bit earlier, but this 2000 was the main starting year when together with my colleagues, Joseph Topal and, and Marta Gacci, we started really the, the, the family dog project, I can say. So, so, why, so why did the department decide to go into dogs? Was it because you didn't have to pay to keep them? <laughs> I mean, well, well, I mean, there are several reasons. I mean, uh, well, you don't know whether I, when you know Professor Chani personally, he was always sort of an inventor. I mean, he has always good, uh, interesting ideas, not always good ideas, but a lot of interesting ideas. And uh, he also liked to be always in front of the others. So the problem was always that you couldn't really talk to, with him about the, your current problem because he was also telling you his future about his future project. So already in the 90s, we were told that, you know, the Paradise Fish is a great project. It's very nice, but it's but the questions you could ask, and I mean, obviously you might know, but maybe the others not so much. At that time, it was not so much a, a fish ecology or fish behavior ecology was not on the top in those years. So our work on fish were really interesting from a psychological perspective, like a comparative psychological perspective, but not really from an ecological perspective. So at some times we really felt that you know it's not any more interesting in science. So we, want, we wanted the switch. And we had a lot of de uh, debates, you know, we should work maybe on urbanization effect on animals or, and then, I mean, the story is at least how I tell the story. <laughs> that <laughs> Professor Chani met an abandoned dog in the woods. <laughs> that is the problem. And he was always a dog lover and, and he, he had always dogs around him. So he adopted the dog and this made him thinking, oh, why not starting a project on dog ecology? It was also not existing at that time. So that was the one reason why, this, why he sort of convinced us step by step that this is a very exciting question. Uh, the problem was that if you go, to, you know, if you want to start a new project, then you start with the literature or so. And that was basically nothing on dogs in the 90s. So two or you can count. I mean, one or two papers were published on very special dog related topics. So anyway, we sort of very nowhere and but he was very much insisting on that, that, you know, this is exciting, this will be, and he had also this, this sort of theory or framework where he explained to us and we keep saying that also that good dogs might be very interesting because they sort of similarity to humans in many respects. That is also why this topic is interesting because you don't only learn about dogs here, but you can also learn something about yourself about humanity or human behavior and actually this is also which also make gives me a lot of other fun apart from uh, dogs that really you can also study humans and you can now also do comparative studies and really have an interesting input even on human psychology and i think from a comparative perspective it was incredibly prescient of him then really to see that coming because i mean i was i moved into academia in 94 and being a vet you know i was only going to work with animals that I knew something about so it was going to be domestic animals and yeah trying to do something on dogs and getting it published and people were sort of well yeah dogs aren't yeah <laughs> dogs aren't animals they're not biology yeah you know? that's uh, true and they also they don't really are real animals and and uh, I think it's also where I mean Lawrence had a dog probably I don't know but Tim Bergen must have had a dog or, so all the famous yeah. people who had the dog but it was so trivial for them to to have those dogs. And even there sometimes, I mean, Lawrence had a lot of anecdotes. He used the dogs as an mm. example a lot of, in a yeah. lot of his writings and actually never made a sort of a con more or less controlled observation <laughs> of those. So it's really interesting how people missed that, that topic, so to speak. Yeah, it, it is. And I mean, it's well, and you have really sort of yeah, put, put it on the map. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, there's several groups and I, I just don't think there'd be as many people working on dogs now if it wasn't for you, um, having done all that. So, you know, we owe a lot to that. And the other, I mean, the other sort of quite remarkable thing, and I don't want to, I don't want this to come across wrong, but, you know, you've stayed in Hungary and you must have had offers from all over the world. People must have been, you know, crying out for your services and say, why did not you move to such and such? But I mean, 
I, 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 I guess I started off by saying your CV, I think, is such an understatement. Um, and it, I was just thinking, yeah, maybe that's just who you are. You're somebody who, yeah, sort of, you know what you're happy with and you're, you're, st you're stuck with it. I don't know. I mean, you only, again, I was, this is the thing that surprised me actually with your CV. You only made full professor in 2011. Yes. You know, when you've true. been churning out all this stuff. Um, well, yeah. In Hungary, I mean, becoming a professor here is really, a, you need a long time. So it's not like in England, for example, you really actually need to get old, sort of. I, so, I mean, it, it's only in the last few years when you have uh, professors who are around uh, younger than 50 years. So usually it's, it's over 50 then. It's not like I think in some other countries. But uh, actually, I didn't get uh, so many offers. So it, I wasn't, didn't get all the time emails that I should, you know, go there and there. So it was not so easy. And especially with ethology in the background. I mean, if you are competing at the international level for positions, it's again, not so easy because uh, I'm not an immunologist. I'm not a neurophysiologist or a neurobiologist. I mean, so it's not so much. Uh, and I think, um, but I'm not complaining. So it's okay. I thought I had my postdoc years in England. I was really happy there for the three years. It was, it was a huge experience for me, you know, how a real university, I really think that, you know, in your universities in England are the sort of the, you know, the, the, ma the, the basics, how university should work, I think, and we can still learn a lot from you in general. So I think that was very important for us and me also. But then the problem was that in Hungary to make science, it's not easy. And uh, already we had some issues or uh, well, little debates with, with Professor Chani, how, my, how long I should stay out there, eh? because really you really need to put in a lot of energy. And I think uh, that was also that I had, I felt a little bit for my colleagues, you know, if I would leave, especially if let's say I come back after, you know, in 2000 and I leave the next three years, then the whole thing would collapse. So it was also a little bit of, you know, I really put in more energy and then obviously if you get older, the less you want to move. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, that's, that's years, true. And, uh, and now it's obviously, you know, too late in that sense maybe now the group could actually be working without me as well so they don't need me anymore at least this is what i really hope that, that now the younger generation can take over but at that time it was really i saw that they needed my help and my experience and maybe also the possibility of getting money by my applications so so on so that was also that kept me home in that sense no obviously you know, everybody's happier to live at home. I am not that type who is migrating from one place to the other with family. And so that was what we, was part of this. And I guess that, that was the other thing, wasn't it? Around about the 90s, there, the, everything had become molecular in biology. And, yes. and then suddenly they, as, as they started to get the sort of genome sorted, they started to think, oh my God, we need whole animal biologists again. And they got rid of them all because their work had sort of gone out of fashion. And yes, I mean, I, I heard, I'm hearing this still with colleagues in ecology that the classical or the experimental field ecology departments are turned to molecular biology departments. And uh, this is actually not a good trend because at some point, and I see it only already actually in, in, in genetics that, okay, yes, you know a lot about the genes and their interactions, but the end, you need the phenotype for the genes. And, and the phenotype could only be produced by, let's say, if it's behavior from a, by an ontologist. Uh, and uh, this is where I also try to fight and get money because we need to get this knowledge continuously from one generation to the other. We might not need hundreds of ontologists or behaviorists, but we need to have a continuous flow <laughs> yeah. or continuous presence of this knowledge. And that's not easy to get because yes, the founding goes to, to those uh, parts of biology who are very practical, especially nowadays. I mean, you know, we want to produce something by new biotechnology, that's always exciting. Um, and difficult to argue against it, but we try. And uh, so what was your big breakthrough with funding? Because again, that's, a, you know, my, my funding has largely been charitable, commercial, and, you know, people who just are willing to come and pay to work with me. Um, but you have been really successful with the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. You've got them on board. Um, and, you know, with good, you, you've got the track record now, but it's always in, you know, it's really difficult to have that breakthrough moment. So when did that happen? And how did you, 
What, 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 can you remember what the grant was? <laughs> well, I mean, we were, we were sort of lucky uh, in, a, in a sense. There were there are two, two sources. One was a European source. We were involved in a European grant in the, in the six framework. Uh, that was together with uh, some very good labs, um, Josep Ko, for example, in Leipzig, and 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 and, uh, and Richard Byrne in in Saint Andrews. So it was a very nice uh, uh, starting for us. They were working on different species, but we had our project on dogs. So that was in the early years of uh, 2000. So I don't remember now the dates. I'm mm. forgot keep forgetting them. And then very, it was very really lucky that. You know, I am a sort of a yes man in that sense that if somebody comes to me, okay, do you want to study life on Mars? And I say, yes, okay, <laughs> let's do it. Why, why not? So, and that happened when, when Kerstin Dottenham come to us and said, okay, she has an idea that maybe robotics could be uh, facilitated or could learn from ethologists. And we want to get in with this project where they are actually working on robots, but you have an interesting project for those. And I said, yes, why not? Let's try. So actually we got this huge grant. It was really huge the whole consortium got about 10 million euros. Wow. And it was like in, in 2008. Uh, and we also got the, our share and it was a fantastic four and a half years. Uh, and maybe so much later, I can also say that not all actions were, uh, our actions were related to robotics. So we did a lot of dog studies also in that project or parallel to that. And it was actually really also uh, informing robotics how to make better um, better robots at the end. So it was a really nice thing. And from that on, we also had, a, we have, still we have actually a research group that is supported by the Academy of Science that also gives us a relatively stable um, sur uh, situation because these research groups are supported for five years. That is also a good time frame. So yes, and you know, one is sort of fed feeding into the other. So I never complained. Actually, in Hungary, to get private funding or anything else than governmental is impossible. So in Hungary, we don't really have big big companies. There we don't have a sort of rich people who would donate uh, science. We don't have this charity system, and and the whole thinking is not like this. So even you know rich people, if not just about dog research, but in general, they don't really donate mm. a lot of money to animal shelters. So yeah. that's not like a habit. We still have to learn that how to do it. So uh, in that sense, our only source can only on, always be basically taxpayers' money, whether it's from Europe or from Hungary. But that's what we are used, and we are really trying to be as careful as we can, uh, in a sense that we really try to. Uh, provide good level or good quality research for that. And I mean, you mentioned about the sort of computer and that seems to be sort of, it's fair to say that's where your heart is now very uh, much well, more. You know, Danny, that's, that's actually complicated. So I sometimes, you know, a student comes to me and, and with this, you know, up lightning airs that he loves, she loves dogs. And then because our department is so special, because if you look through the glass door, you can see that in our department, there are dogs running around. And so it's a lovely place. And they come to me, okay, they want to be, they want to have a dissertation or an MSc, whatever in ethology. And I say to them, okay, it's good. I can teach you this, or we can, we can teach you that. <clears throat> but then if you want to have a job, you know, you are, you really believe that you will get a job as an ethologist. And I remember some colleagues for me told me that she, they are working now in England, that there was maybe a job advertisement for an uh, ethologist and there were 200 applications. You know, what is the chance that you will get it? And, and, and such jobs are maybe every five or 10 years. So it's really impossible. So what I have also was my, I don't want to just give them a, a diploma, but I also want them to give them other skills. And then I always say, okay, uh, what kind of other skills you can get? And then I say, okay, we can also teach you a little bit of genetics because we have research in that, that way. We have also some research on our neurobiology. So we, you can also learn this with us. Or, and this is the alternative, we can also teach you some um, IT technology or computing or, or robotics that can you give you the chance that you have, could enter <clears throat> a new, new jobs that are open and actually now one of my postdocs, uh, sorry, PhD student, she is actually now a, a data analyst basically. <laughs> and because she was working on three, four, three years of F analyzing ephemeral data and, and she learned that technology and she got this job and she's probably- Is that Dora? It's Dora, yes. Yeah, yes. Dora Shaba. Okay. Yeah, so, you know them. Yeah, of yes. course, no, because she's, she's the one who came around sort of 
and well, well we'll talk about dora in a minute because seeing as yeah yeah, um, yeah so actually so that was that is it's, but but you are right i also felt sort of in love with the robots and there are several i mean i could talk about for an hour about just this because i really think that uh, okay you asked it. <laughs> well, that's fine i don't, I don't no, mind this is i think and that maybe you were there at the conference i have this imagination that you know behavior studies especially comparative psychology is stuck where it was 100 years ago and we never improved in a way how we do our science we do this very same similar experiments you know that was done by Thorndike, by skinner you know you name it and really i think the robotics could really give us insights what actually should give you insights how different we can actually study animals what kind of new ways we can offer in method methodology. So this is why I want to support ethology on the one hand and robotics on the other hand, because I think the two things belong very much together. And, um, and that's why we started to work on eto robotics and you know, all that other ex very exciting stuff, because I think that one break, uh, one uh, really breakthrough where ethology can really be not just practical, but also help is, uh, is robotics really. And it is a feedback. We can also learn how animals are working by studying a robot behavior. I see. This is why you, you're so successful. And I just thought, because I'm, as I said, I'm still a vet at heart. And I thought, I'm just thinking <laughs> about funny. the clinical implications of this, that, and the other. Yeah. You know, <laughs> sort of. And it, it is interesting, though, because you know, you you speak to somebody who is a biologist, <laughs> as you call yourself. You know, and it's just the way you think about things. And you know, and I, I do notice that with the way and it, yeah it's a skill that i've had to slowly learn is how to get the better impact papers the way you address the whole question is so different i know and i guess for me the thing that i'm interested in is and and i agree with you a lot of the comparative psychology is it's a bit yeah you say a bit run of the mill it's the same sort of experiments and I think because I'm a clinician, I'm interested in individual variation. And I always have been what makes this individual different and the traditional science of this population versus this population, that's of no use to me, you know, to know that the breed of dog, this breed of dog is more likely to get this condition because it's not of that breed and it's here in front of me. And I got to sort it out, you know, yes. so I don't want to know so much about populations. I want to know about, yeah, what makes individuals. And I think that's how I've ended up working on emotion because it's emotion that makes individuals individuals. And yeah, I mean, I, I, we did have right. colleagues here working on putting emotions into robots and their personal judgments. And we wanted to do cog bias tests on some of these robots <laughs> and see if they could get pessimistic. <laughs> but uh, well, uh, yes. Um, and Sean Lawson, who you know as well, mm -hmm. I mean, he's, I mean, he actually still lives locally, although he's moved up to, um, Newcastle and uh, I mean he, for the people who don't know him he's a uh, human computer uh, interactions and also gets interested in the animals so we had this project whereby we got a, a fair bit of money out of Microsoft to see what happens to people when you embody a, a robot so basically what people had to do was people were told that we were testing the um linguistic understanding of a, a robotic system and it was it was what they call wizard of oz system which is basically mm -hmm. the, the robot can't do what you think it can do there's somebody behind a curtain controlling it i'm, I'm and, abused it, yes. <laughs> and it, i mean it was great fun because what we did is we had several versions of the robot it was a bit like a, a Roomba, you know one of those vacuum yes. cleaners mm -hmm. and then we had the um we had the sort of standard version then we had a version with uh, eyes on it and then we had a furry version with eyes on it as well <laughs> what we found was um and people will be amazed that you know a company gives money for this sort of thing but you know with the, what they i think what microsoft were interested in is would people be more forgiving of a robot making mistakes if it looked a bit more animated mm -hmm. um and, you know, that does have practical applications because, you know, and this is what we sold it to them as, you know, people get really frustrated when their computer crashes and, you know, they have no patience with a computer, stupid computer and whatever. And, you know, if we could make people a little bit more tolerant. So what we actually found was that and obviously the computer, we deliberately made mistakes on trying to get it to retrieve. And as soon as you started to embody it, it was really interesting, the effect, because 
if you looked at the overall effect, there was no overall effect. But if you looked at the population, it went from initially, you know, people were pretty annoyed with it when it made mistakes. You embody it and you've got two <laughs> extremes. You've got people who absolutely went ballistic at the <laughs> computer, at the robots, and just sort of saying, you know, <laughs> absolutely furious, it should know better. And then other people did become much more understanding and tolerant of it and treated it like a little animal and said, oh, let's nudge it. But of course, at a population level, it's bang in the middle again. <laughs> So, yeah. but yeah, it, it is fascinating. And well, the rise of AI, I think is personally, I think is quite scary. Um, you know, some of the stuff that you're seeing now coming out with AI and what it can do. And um, <clears throat> if we if we don't get on, if we don't understand where it, it could get, and it's just sort of the power of it. Um, yeah. Yes, but I would often say to this uh, is that it's basically like the the atomic power. You know, you can do something good with it, although you might doubt whether having electricity by this is a good thing, but you can basically control it and produce something relatively mm -hmm. good or and also really some doing something bad. So obviously this is what <clears throat> I mean, the problem is if you really want to build a humanoid or Android robots, because there is this belief that, you know, humans are much better interacting with, uh, with a human like robot. This is dangerous, <clears throat> but if you just keep them in their specific niche and they are all other types of robots, but not humans, that, that should not cause such a big difference. And actually, this is why we are also studying that same thing with robots, the emotions that, okay, even if you have not a human-like body, but you show emotions like dogs, for example, do, then people are just have fine with it. So it's mm. not a problem that they don't have a human body or look. So I think, I mean, I think the thing with AI, and we'll better get start talking about dogs because you know, most people okay, have switched fine, up. Yeah, Anybody <laughs> listening to this recording probably will have switched off by now. Um, thinking, oh, I thought they're going to talk about dogs, but we will. Um, but it's it's the power of AI to problem solve and, and, and the security that comes with that. You know, we, we have to go back to doing things face to face. You know, hey. <laughs> Get rid of COVID, we'll go back to being face to face. So let's, let's talk about dogs, shall we? Um, so, I, as I said, one of the papers, and it's I, I didn't realize again, this is a paper you got, I think it's this one, you'll probably correct me and say, no, it's not. This is this got awarded paper of the year. A simple reason for a big difference wolves do not look back at humans, but dogs do. And I, it was I, not the not awarded paper, but it was a very highly cited, it's still a highly cited. I, I was going to say, <laughs> that wasn't the one that got the award. Which was the one that got the award? Like, <laughs> No, because the, the award got that the, there's this award specific for, specific for the journal. Oh. So the, the Journal of Comparative Psychology used to have this system. Uh, they might still have it, but they give an award to the best paper of the year. That was published in Current Biology, so that is a different. Ah, okay. So, so what was the paper? What was the name of the paper that got the award? Well, that there was actually two papers, but one was on social learning in dogs. By by that was the first author were Enrico Cubini. And it was, I never found out why it got any award. Actually, it was not a, such a good paper, but you know, it's good. Uh, so it was about, I mean, one of the first papers where we showed that dogs actually learn by observation from humans. And yeah, this might be just okay. interesting to to that. So, I mean, I, I love the current biology paper, the, the, the difference between wolves and dogs. First of all, because yeah, you know, to me, dogs learning to use vision, everyone, you know, everybody has, for so long said oh dogs have got some fantastic sense of smell that you know and they they live in this world and yeah they've got a fantastic sense of smell but to be a successful dog you have to learn not to use it most of the time and you have to watch humans and i and and this is to me the the sort of big thing is that um and I, i'd be interested in because i'm not sure i've asked you this but you know i don't think dogs and this people are going to hate me saying this i don't think dogs are that smart that they're incredibly observant and well, they know yeah. what then and, and they they're very well attuned to doing the right thing to get things to work yes. um but as far as cognitive ability goes well i mean it depends what you would so so we used to say i mean but really it's really among ourselves so i hope yeah. i know this ticket really seriously but they should that uh, that yes dogs are smart enough to look smart enough so so i think that this is a skill you know that, that actually is a skill i mean being a good actor is something that you have to do even if the actor is playing you know albert einstein if it would it's a good experience on the stage 
it's a good actor, even if he's very stupid. <laughs> so, yeah. so, you know, I mean, but it's not a problem for us because, and that's also the problem sometimes of comparative psychology or comparative etiology, how you would like call it, that there's this, this, um, this is this, this um, um, the race for showing, you know, that this species uh, is more clever. I really hate this. Yeah. Today I would ask again, is a cat less clever than a dog? And I know that now I have to explain it in five minutes, you know, <laughs> why, why was this question totally wrong? So, so yes, from cognitive, but, but that's, I think, the work of the ethologist really to find out what are those little things that makes this uh, difference and in what way, well, they might, might not use the word clever, but in what way the dogs are really adapting to that specific social niche and what they pick up on and, and where they react. And in some cases, they really put together some interesting um, understanding of the environment, which is part of the human, you know, part of what you have. So, yeah. But that, but that is part of the problem that sometimes, you know, people want to be able to stake the big claim. And, you know, because that's what brings in the grants and things like that. If, if you can show, oh, dogs have this fantastic ability and, um, and it, you know, it's, it depends how complicated things are. But yeah, dogs, I think, are very observant. They, and they, yeah, they're very well adapted for working out what works for them and appearing smart. And again, I think this is me as the clinician, I come into this and sort of, because people think that, you know, dogs seem to be able to problem solve as well as a human. And then they have these expectations and they wonder why then, you know, why isn't the dog responding to me telling him off in this way and that way and think, because he doesn't think like that. He's just watching and trying to, you know, get the, um, the rules right. But one of my colleagues, I think said to me that, that you know, if you try to publish something in dogs and make a claim about their cognitive ability, you know, um, generally, you know, people are always very skeptical of, of those claims. If it's a chimpanzee, N equals one, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. In, yes. fact, there is that slight sort of, are we going off away from dogs again? I know, but there's so much more interesting things to talk about. But, you know, but there is that slight, um, sort of snobbery that well no, it's not snobbery that's not the right word I don't know what the word is but in primate work you know and you you recently wrote that paper on puffins and maybe we'll just talk about puffins for a bit because I, I thought that was a really nice paper that sort of um I'll let you you explain the paper um and I posted a comment on it actually but I, just for people that haven't read the paper do you want to say a bit about the, the well, recent I mean yes paper? because actually the we were totally surprised that uh, by the paper that it was published and really very in some sense upset. It's always complicated how you criticize your colleagues uh, sort of in an open manner. But the idea is that some people actually got some videos, let's put it in a very simple way, uh, that where a puffin was picking up a stick. And then uh, it was sort of nearing the stick end to his uh, belly feathers. And it really looks like, if you just look at the video, that the puffin is actually uh, scratching his uh, his body. And then it was interpreted automatically as a tool use because the puffin was obviously picking the stick in order to, and that's the word is important, in order to do that or this other action. And then uh, that was based on two observations. Uh, actually, only from one, we had a video that was 14 seconds long. And yeah, it upset, but not so many people were upset because really for for proving something, we need, would need more. And that's actually what we also try to explain in this, our criticism or response, that how you should really deal in the modern times of uh, presenting some uh, N equals one data, especially if you have no ways to repeat it or, or observe it again, even in that single interval. So I think this is where we really have, can improve ethology, I mean, in general, to make it more scientific in some sense. I would recommend that paper to anybody who is starting out yeah and is thinking about how do I how do I deal with an anecdote and I, it's nice the way that you've broken it down and sort of this is the way that we ought to be reporting anecdotes and again it's that it's that biologist in you coming out again you know this is what we need to do rather than rush in and think ah you know um, this is you know yeah 
as, as, ascribing the reason why they're doing it and it's again you see it so much in well you see it in any species but with the cats and dogs and horses people are constantly interpreting their animal it's the one thing we spend so much time with our students sort of distinguish what you can observe from your interpretations get a decent description first please so that i know what you're talking about and you've got the video as well but you've got to separate those two processes because otherwise yeah you make these leaps of faith and then you gather all the evidence to support that belief yeah. and you completely ignore the evidence that says there's no way that's what's going on um so i will i'll put a link to that paper up where when i post this up but um i'm not sure how we got onto puffins but um well, about maybe good methodology or something where you wanted actually to turn to dogs and i even try to sometimes to come back to dogs but it's, it's <laughs> I don't, I don't shut up. <laughs> yeah. tell me something about dogs I, 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 well, I mean but dogs are still exciting and and yeah. i could by the way with the puff, puffins we could also i could also say that we now what we now doing with this uh, Italian uh, gifted dog project where we have these uh, dogs who are able to learn the words. I mean, we get now back from the referees, but our papers when we try to publish it uh, in one on a one dog uh, that this one dog is actually able to learn hundreds of words. He's able to categorize, and then you get back you get thrown out from different journals by saying you know what's interesting in that. And it was not a one observation, it was a half year on work on one dog, following obviously our uh, logic, what we actually wrote in that puffing paper. And, you know, they just said, well, you know, this is not interesting. And on the other hand, they're publishing something that uh, based on 15 second observation. So I think really that is what we have to learn as scientists to be really serious and, and look at the phenomenon. And with the word learning dogs, we really say that if you would ask, we have no idea what's going on even after having a study for two years. And now we have 10 dogs who are really different from all the others. And people don't, you know, they, I, can, I get emails from the pessimists saying, well, it might just depend on training, you know, and good ownership. And no, I mean, all those owners are totally ordinary, <laughs> uh, you know, dog owners. They have actually, they, usually they don't know that they have such a gifted dog. We have to tell them, <laughs> it's very exciting. Um, so again, I will put up the link for the gifted dog. If if you send me the details, we'll put that up as well in case anybody yeah. wants to get involved. Because I know you're still recruiting in um, on some of yeah. that stuff. But yeah, so that okay, so, um, because um, you know, with the stuff you're doing on MRI scanning in dogs and starting to look at their response to commands again, I mean that is a, another really big leap. Um, being able to do that and I mean and yeah so I mean where do you see that going now well I mean again because uh, you know sometimes also interesting to maybe say something not directly things so the fMRI idea we had in um, let's say 2008 with Marta where we really were being sure that you know that's a fantastic thing. Now you also need somebody there. And Martha Gatch is one of those persons who's a very good dog trainer, apart from being a good scientist. So who can tell you, okay, I can make not all, but many dogs quiet and calm and steady for six minutes, which is actually difficult even for a human to do. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then with a lot of, I mean, we need again luck for that, that some per people, I mean, Otil Andic, who is the main guy, he's a neurobiologist, who actually, uh, came to us and saying he is uh, willing from to switch from a very safe research working on human fMRI and leave everything behind and go for uh, this basically you know a territory of nowhere it's like Antarctica <laughs> no but nothing was known about this and then I mean Attila came a little bit later it took, took us uh, well I don't remember now when the first paper was published maybe in, in 14 so you know eight years maybe more to actually get to the first paper. So you have to be really, if you have a vision, you have to follow it, but that's very difficult. And I was really lucky to actually being able to follow these visions. And we were be having one, maybe one of the first papers, not uh, the, on this topic. So what, what is the future? Well, I think it's a huge potential because apparently you can't put any other animal with a large brain that has a lot of comparable social skills that we have mentioned before uh, to humans. It's very difficult to put a chimpanzee in, in an fMRI scanner. Uh, it's probably close to impossible to put in monkeys in general. And because the other part of how you keep them 
how you get them, uh, not just to actually the fMRI, but also whether you're allowed to keep them, whether you should keep them. There are lots of ethical issues, but there we have this uh, species, the dogs who have not a huge brain, so it's not, not really <laughs> comparable to ours, but still, you know, you can see it <laughs> quite well. And now the technology is improving, so these scanners get more and more sensitive. And I think this really gives us a very nice uh, way of looking at the, the way how uh, this very thin border from the mental representation to the neurobiological, the neuro representation, and, and think of about this. And what is really exciting, and what we now also do it, but it makes obviously these studies more expensive and, and more complicated, that you can expose humans and dogs at the very same uh, stimuli based on the fact that they also have, you know, the similar ex experiences. So probably, you know, a dog owner has seen as many cars as a dog that he, she or he has at home. Maybe obviously the dog was not so much thinking about the cars, but at least the perceptual uh, information is in his brain. So we can use cars um, in this experiment to find out, you know, what is the location or the representation of the cars or more generally non-living beings or living beings in the dog's brain. And so we can really compare the representation. And I think it's also important because what we talked at the beginning, that it not just gives the information about, okay, how dogs are doing that, but also this comparison shows, shows how, what is maybe special in humans and what is more general in animals. I mean, if the dog is now representing animals, which probably is also not really true. So I think this is a very exciting perspective and because we are at the beginning. I mean, these studies are continuously thrown out from uh, human oriented journals, I must admit, because the standards for humans are so high uh, and uh, you know they don't really like it. I mean, we had actually just in the autumn, we managed to publish the first paper in a neurobiological journal that is mainly devoted to human uh, work, but uh, we're getting there and it will be improved hopefully in the future. So that's really, I think, it, the, I can see the perspectives are endless and you know, maybe I'm mentioning it too often, but our gifted dog project with the world learning, you can imagine that this would be also a very new perspective if you manage to put those dogs in the scanner, but there are some logistic problems that the scanners are in Budapest and the dogs are <laughs> in the world everywhere. So at the moment we are far from that, but we try to achieve that as well. Yeah. It's, it's funny because, um, you know, my colleague, former colleague, Helen Zulch, when she first joined us, she had this idea of MRI with dogs and we started to work it out and we even went down to London to get one dog sort of put in there to get an idea. And then your paper, we found out that you were doing, oh, forget it, we're not going to go there. Let's, we're not going to even start there. Why not? I mean, I'm not agreeing with this because... Really and, and, well, it was, just, it, it was trying to get the funding for it. Um, but it's, it's funny, though, how you know, as scientists, and it, it's very easy, isn't it, to sort of think, oh, somebody's stolen my idea. But actually, if you're working in similar areas, you come to similar conclusions thinking you see the same opportunities. Um, yes, but, you know, the, the, but then but the problem is, yes, I mean, science should also change in a bit and is changing what you can see, for example, in physics, where they are collaborating because you can't have the equipment for yourself. I mean, the whole equipment is yeah. a 100 kilometer peak so yeah. you know it's not just for you yeah. so and i think for us actually the problem is really that and that's why we are thrown out of the journals because the, the dog sample size is small mm -hmm. i mean we have let's say 15 dogs and i used to, to scanning uh, 50 people which is mm -hmm. easy for do easy to do but we can't because we cannot train and you know it's complicated so yeah. um, if you would do 15 then we'd have 30 together and it would be a much better paper at the end uh, so Actually, we are looking for that kind of co collaboration. We also obviously could do different things, but some interaction and collaboration would be really useful. Yeah, and so, I am totally for that. So, I mean, Vienna's, I, I, did they, were they successful with their bid for an MRI? Yes, they, they are now starting publishing yeah. papers as well. Yes. So, yeah. the Vienna group. So, that brings us back to Dora, actually. So, we mentioned <laughs> Dora. So, for people who don't know Dora, um, so Dora did a bit of work. One of the things that, um, you know, again, we, we've already mentioned is trying to get replicability. And we've had various studies where, you know, if you publish something and if you find a slightly different result or you find a negative result, it's very difficult to publish that negative result um, in the face of somebody who's found that this effect does seem to exist. Um, and so we managed to get 
the money out of that European um, CompCog grant. And Dora basically had spent some time in Hungary, in Vienna and in Lincoln doing the same experiment and to see if we got the same results because it seemed that we weren't replicating. And we didn't know whether it was because the dogs were different, whether we weren't replicating the protocols. So, um, and, you know, and, and, uh, and she managed to do it. And it's one of the few studies out there where, which has got replicability. And it's actually really quite interesting, I think, the results. In fact, it's a shame she's gone off and decided to become a data analyst. But, but the one big difference that she did find was between British dogs and the Viennese and the Hungarian dogs was that the British dogs were much less obedient. <laughs> Which yes. I was thinking, you know, and everybody's here saying, oh, you know, we should be you know, clicker training all of our dogs and doing this, that and the other. And actually that they had more, she had more of an issue there than with anything else, which I thought was quite interesting <laughs> to say the least, because people would think, oh, you know, British yes, people. Yes, but it's also interesting that we generally got actually quite similar results, but it was also encouraging that, you know, these were obviously basic tests, so not very delicate ones, but it's good to see that, and that also would support really that we might need more international uh, collaborations. The only problem was that we really actually had some applications many years ago, and I think at that time, you were not really involved in that. We tried to put together 10 dog labs, uh, uh, but we never succeeded. So um, maybe it might, we should try again, especially if there would be some European founding for that. Obviously, now there's a little bit. <laughs> hey, we're not going to be part of Europe. <laughs> well, you know, but you may, you know, there's already special status. So we can actually yeah. have, have uh, people from the US or Canada or Australia even involved. So maybe. You know, Britain will have the same status, so it should not. Oh be no, we'll be we'll be worst in the world. I'll say, you know, yeah, I know, I know. You want to be. We'd rather have a Martian than the Brits. <laughs> yes, yes, you are, yes. Yeah. Okay, but anyway, I mean, this is for science. It's it's yeah. obviously solvable. I think the issue and and but but I think it would be nice because it also could show that you can work together yeah. and it would achieve much better um, science at the end if there would be more yeah. collaboration. Yeah, no, absolutely. That I mean, that CompCog grant was really good. I actually, you know, you do these things and you think, oh, what's going to come? But it really did help to bring a lot of people together. I think um, in a, and it worked really well. So those, you know, networking grants. And again, anybody who's listening who's not familiar with them, the European networking grants, they are really worthwhile going for and, and yeah, helping to build those relationships. Um, but. Uh, uh, something uh, there was something I was going to say. No, but, oh, it's gone anyway. But yeah, so I say Dora did a great piece of work. Oh yeah, no, that was it. The, the, so this is something we never published, and you know, again, you know, several people ended up doing modified Ainsworth tests. And again, for people who don't know, the Ainsworth test is a test of measuring attachment between an animal and it, uh, or, and it, two individuals. The idea is that the attachment figure is the caregiver, and and the figure that is attached is the one that um, gets the care from them. And you can study the behavior in relation to that individual versus a stranger in an unusual environment um, in order to establish that there is a, uh, an attachment bond. And it, the whole, one of the key features of an attachment bond is it's fairly unique. It's limited to a few individuals who are the caregivers. And of course, you got the first paper out on it. <laughs> your, your group. It's actually very, also an interesting story, but okay. uh, well, uh, well, uh, oh, tell me this. Tell me the story, and we'll come back. Or... Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, don't forget the story is actually not complicated. So when we uh, started the first paper, that was in 1998. Mm. Actually, it was our second paper at uh, at on a whole. Uh, nobody would. I mean, there was really such an ignorance for that. I mean, I remember the reviewer saying, "Okay, well, you can publish this, but who cares about?" A dog is being attached to a human. And if you look at the how this paper is cited, is is really getting more cited today. And what I'd also tell some dog people when they're asking about, you know, okay, you are scientists and what you are, uh, you know, why are you, what is your role in this whole dog's, dog uh, world? But I always tell them, okay, the only thing you go back to your bookshelves where you have probably hundreds of dog uh, training books and then check. How many times attachment is mentioned before, let's say, 2005? And then nowadays, you don't have one book which is not mentioning, you know, that the key either is attachment and the 
what is called usually the management of document <laughs> contact. So really, I think we had an influence and a very strong one. So I'm very proud on that in that sense that we really actually are helping um, dog science or canine science to really establish some new insights. Let's put it this way. So I, that's what that is the story. So it's an interesting paper. Well, I'll come. I'll come back to my my bit with the dogs yeah. in a minute. But um, I don't know if I've ever told you the story of uh, the the cat work that we did. So yeah, I know that I know there is I know the. the do, you know, do, you, do you know what the, the fallout paper. was of it though? So again, for people who didn't don't know, you know, the work was done in dogs and. Um, uh, and then somebody published a paper where they claimed they'd done the same with cats, but they hadn't. Uh, and it was a, a group in Mexico, um, Edwards and uh, the late Moises Heiblum. And they, when we looked at it, we just sort of looked at it and thought, hang on, there's all sorts of things that haven't been controlled for here. So we did a version which was counterbalance where you did all of the sequences in one order and then you did the reverses uh, in the reverse sequence. And we only then used measures that were reliable. And the first thing about cats was that, pardon me, when it comes to cats, they they are so variable that, you know, there were very few reliable measures. And quite apart from some other um, issues with the design, the fact that the cat spent more time with the owner in the, the way they'd done it, um, you know, and that biased the results. And so we said, if you look at what is going on in the cats, if you only use reliable measures, the only thing you can say is that they meow more when the owner's not there, when they're left with the stranger than when they're left with the owner and the stranger is gone. And you can't claim that that's the basis for attachment because um, it could just be frustration. Um, and so we published the paper well, of course, newspapers get hold of it. Scientists find out what we always knew. Cats hate their owners, you know, because <laughs> they're, they're saying they don't have, we can't claim that they have an attachment bond. Well, of course, newspapers aren't interested in looking at the fine detail of what we mean by an attachment bond. It's, hey, Mills has found that cats hate their owners. And I got yeah, I, so I much vitriol. I got emails from people and I must say mainly from the US, of people saying, I've just inherited fortune. I'm going to spend it on ruining your career. You should never publish again. And, and this sort of stuff, and it was just before Christmas, I remember. And it was a good job because I got it because the co-author, she was a former uh, master's student and it was really unpleasant. She's, um, I'm just sort of thinking, whoa. And it, the, it, I remember reading one sort of stream and there was all this vitriol um that was coming out and of course the university was interesting because their name was all over it they said, oh well at least you're getting the university's name out there I was, I was reading this stuff and then somebody said has anybody actually been to his web page because there's a picture of him and a cat i don't think he's a cat hater <laughs> you know <laughs> just thought, yeah. thank you there's <laughs> one redeeming soul but it was people were so sort of how dare you imply this and it's so all we're saying is it might be a different form. And we've got some really neat data, actually. Um, I was reading some, um, some through some of it this afternoon from another student. And it, we've got some, yeah, really nice stuff about what we think might be going on as far as the relationship between cats and their owners. And it is, it's actually so much more sophisticated. Um, mm -hmm. And there's so much more to it than just the attachment side. Um, but, um, but anyway, yeah, so back to Ainsworth test and dogs. So... A, a study that we did round about the same time, and we didn't publish it because we didn't. Um, so yeah, it would have been round about ninety eight, um, and we did it with very young puppies because we were interested in um, sort of looking at interventions to try and reduce stress in puppies at the time. And in the really young puppies, and I know that groups have found it in young puppies as well, but. Uh, and you might be able to put me right, but I think the Viennese group, again, um, Ludwig's group found a similar thing that in our group of puppies, we couldn't, we didn't see the, the attachment. And again, before people scream at the, the video saying, what are you saying? All we're saying is that the, the puppies were just as affectionate towards the stranger as they were with the um, owner. And, you know, so we couldn't use it as a, a model in that situation. And, and I was trying to, I've been sort of thinking about this and I'd just be interested in your thoughts on it because 
I've been trying to work out well, why didn't we see it um, and sort of and why did you and I just wondered and this, this is my thought and you probably come up with a much smarter explanation but in the UK you know you cannot sell puppies through shops they go from breeder into the home and it's generally probably a less stressful experience than what I understand was going on in Hungary and in other countries where the animals would be in in um, may come from anywhere in Europe shipped over or put in a shop sold and whatever and I just you know one of the things we know about attachment is you'll see it much more under situations of stress and I just wondered if that might explain the difference or whether you got any thoughts <clears throat> about that well I mean I must in this case ask how old were the puppies that you were studying they, they were probably about nine to twelve probably about nine weeks old nine weeks oh. yeah yeah, so so basically then around two months or or even less yeah, yeah. so they were they so, were fairly I mean, new into the homes that's the thing oh, okay. but you know Marta has shown that you can get it in about 40 minutes with a rescue dog so yeah but you know that's that i mean the rescue dogs are other yeah. animals so they, yeah. not obviously but that yeah. was the in that phase so there are, i think it's uh, the situation is more complicated so your explanation is uh, i don't know about the viennese dogs but in our case when we measured that were they were older puppies so our puppies were four months mm. old or even older and this was basically a comparative work where we looked at the attachment of dog uh, or sorry dog puppies and wolf puppies or wolf cubs mm. because we wanted to see whether there's a difference uh, between the two species in that regard and we found uh, that there's a difference first of all but we didn't find a full attachment in a sense in the, those even older puppies that would really be totally comparable for with an, to an adult dog or a juvenile dog even. But from a biological point of view, I think, uh, you know, if you're starting looking at how dogs are developing or even the ancestors or the wolves, then there is this, um, uh, this stage that we call the, the socialization period that actually a lot of people think it's just a couple of uh, weeks, but actually it's, it takes longer, especially for some breeds. And so basically I think the attachment, what you also mentioned is specific to an individual. Now in the pack, in a typical pack, you don't need uh, this uh, attachment for an individual. What you actually need is the attachment to the pack as a group, because you are together for a quite a long time, actually. Now, so I think even dogs might have uh, still this, um, this feature or in behavior. So when they are take them home, uh, they're let's say at two months or even three months of age, they still are in that phase where they regard everybody as possible pack member. And this closing down of the sensitive period that might actually happen like a four, five or six months of age, you know, that's where they are looking at strangers. Now really somebody who is a, a stranger and not anymore the member so and i think even if you, you need time for that so that so and we now actually got a cat my son got now a cat uh, just uh, this week and you know with the cat you have to be hurrying up a little bit more oh sorry uh, uh so i just switched off the phone so and uh, with the cats, you really have to hurry. So what I'm doing now, I invite all the members of the family uh, to visit him to get this sense of, you know, they are not just two persons <laughs> in his life or in her, yeah. uh, in her life. And you can also do it with the dogs in order to keep them socialized. But with the dogs, it's easier because you walk them. So with the dogs, it's very natural that uh, they meet on the street, a lot of strangers, and they learn that, you know, the world is bigger than, than just the home environment. With the cat, Especially with this very close uh, socialization period, it's it's you get a cat that is totally happy with the owner, but is freaked out or frightened with anybody who is a stranger. So, but they can also learn this and they can use to this. So I think this is a, a difference. But but I think generally what that would be my thought that this is okay. about uh, the socialization, how it is organized in in a social memo. Okay. Yeah, no, I hadn't thought about it like that. That's, that's a really good. This is why I like this. Why I like doing these sessions. It's great. Um, I said this is exactly what we would probably be doing at a conference. I'll ask you the question. Yeah, yes. Back with some. Um, so, um, so yeah. So the other the other thing, just sort of, I've, I've just wanted to chat to you about uh, sort of. And this is a general sort of um, comment. You know, we've talked several times about sort of dog wolf comparisons. And again, I just sort of, again, personally, I have some, 
uneasy. I, there's brilliant work getting going on there, you know, and I don't I, I don't want people to misunderstand. It is absolutely brilliant work, but it is that generalization to wolves when actually it's the same eight, 12 wolves that are being tested every time. And I, I you know, do you, are you, how comfortable are you with sort of some of the comparisons that are being made? Um, well, it's difficult to say because again, um, I mean, yeah, I think uh, the argument would be you can have both. Either you are, we have no way to get data from mm. wolves, only from from free living animals, and probably that is the the trend in the long term that uh, we, we we actually move from from observing like chimpanzees in captivity rather than going to Africa or, or, or other places or even chimpanzee sanctuaries, but they are in Africa at least, where you can observe them in a sort of a semi-captive situation. And I think this is a good way forward. Well, you know, in older times, I mean, uh, in the 2000, uh, earlier 2000s, you, that was this other idea that yes, there was, there is, and was at that time not much on wolves from a very close range observation. There was very little, I mean, we did some studies on this comparative uh, um, approach, but we, our philosophy was different because we really wanted to have a very intensive human wolf relationship and then um, compare it to a similarly intensive uh, document relationship while the work in, in Vienna is a little bit different. But I think uh, people will also realize sooner or later that this is not the major trend in the future. So I think it is a useful project. We have the data, um, but it's difficult to continue because also you need a lot of uh, financial support for that. And that was the one reason for me. So, so why we gave up? Because again, no, I not shouldn't say again, but we were the first, I think, who did such experiments in a larger scale, which means 10 animals, so it was not a huge, mm. <laughs> it was just larger compared to in uh, one wolf. But um, so, you know, if you are getting a wolf puppy, it's easy for the, relatively easy to have the first few weeks or even a year, but what you, it's a 14 year or five, 15 year project. So what you do, do you with the wolf afterwards? And that's why I was thinking that, you know, that's not really fair. So, so on that um, level or for that sort of investment, I don't really want to have scientific data. And I also see that, uh, there is such a huge variability among dogs, e even not just at the individual level, but but also in, at the individual level, because you have feral dogs, you have dogs that have very different relationship with people. But also the breeds are giving you this opportunity to compare at a wide basis. Then really, such experiments or dogs or, or sorry on wolves are not so important anymore, and that's what my personal view would be. But you know, I mean, it, it's, I'm always interested in reading mm. those papers and then, you know, thinking about, you know, what can we learn from those and how you could generalize those data to wolves in, in general, where actually wolves are also very different, but you should know. I mean, you probably, you know, comparing Canadian wolves or, yeah. or wolves yeah. in Mexico or compared to the European wolves. I mean, we know that there are big differences as well. Mm. Yeah. So just out, just out of curiosity, what do you think is the most exciting dog wolf comparative piece of work that's been done to date? Uh, well, exciting. I mean, most uh, interesting. You think? Oh, that's, well, I mean, that's... it's problematic because obviously um, I don't know, don't know by heart now all the no. wolf papers. I think, for example, a very exciting one was this, which actually I was uh, I interpreted totally differently when uh, it was shown in this. I think it was a uh, um, Royal Society paper, proceedings paper on comparing dogs and wolves packs. And the argument was that the do wolf, wolves are more tolerant compared to the dogs. And they were arguing for that sort of uh, comparison, which basically the article was about that wolves were sharing a piece of meat, a big piece of meat, and they were the dominant was tolerant for um, uh, sharing the food with, uh, with subordinate wolves. While the case of a dog, the, the most dominant dogs in a wolf pack actually were really excluding all the others from the feeding. And then that was an interpretation which you could also have it in a different way. But I think this was really interesting again, mm. because I think sometimes the papers are not interesting because they provide very exciting data. And then that's also another issue in, in this comparative field that it's not usually about actual data, it's about the idea and this mental, you know, game or play that how you can interpret it, what new thoughts you might have, 
and um, and how you can make even a better one next time. So yeah. I think this is uh, was for me really uh, interesting. I'm going to ask you this, and this is just me teasing you. Do you think we have enough papers on pointing in dogs yet? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I think we have, I saw, sometimes saw that the, I was not allowed any more people, any more touch papers on the department, but, you know, it's like a yeah. water maze, you know, remember, I mean, water mazes are, for, in red people, it's very typical, and yeah. then if you have a new question, and, and using a water maze is not, nothing bad. Another thing is, which I really like, especially, uh, but I, it's part of the teaching, that, uh, you know, how people should really think a little bit beyond the trivial. That was actually the reason that when we started our discussion where we had to stop our fish work because we hadn't actually, we, I really should say that we hadn't got really good ideas anymore. So just was, we could only make, you know, new experiment that was just, you know, a little bit further from the previous one. And you mainly knew what was coming out as a result. And I also keep telling, I learned it from Professor Chani. I keep telling my students, if you know what will be the result of the experiments, please do not do it. <laughs> so, because you know you should really get a little bit ahead of your thinking in that sense yeah I, I think I'm the same and it's that it's that curious mind and you know and I think that's the thing it's just sort of I most of my PhD students are actually on completely different topics I can think of two students who worked on impulsivity you know and because I think right okay done that let's go and do something else now you know find something else and um and it is it's that um but it, it is neat the pointing stuff you know and um yeah exactly what it tells us but it's it reminds me of um somebody saying sort of well if you want to get on in horses in you know in the horse behavior world you have to publish a paper on stereotypic behavior in horses you know because everyone has to do a survey on what are the factors affecting stereotypic behavior but somewhat bizarrely there's been very few surveys done in the US um, on that but um, but everybody seems to have a variant who's got an interest in horses um, so so I mean we, we've talked about um, sort of the, the fMRI stuff but just sort of well I know that, to me one of the big up-and-coming stars is somebody in your own lab in Eniko Kubinyi I think she's you know um, who else do you see as the big stars up and coming in the future? Well, it's, it's difficult because there are older stars and, and younger stars. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, we're old so, now, so I'm and, afraid we're the old yeah, ones. And if you're speaking especially at, at generally younger people, but there's age difference, it's difficult. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah, but yeah not, not like, their age, but where they are in their career. And you can think no, this no, person okay, is going to go Enrico off. He's really ahead of her career. So he's a, he's a star, but actually he's an established scientist for the moment and she is doing very well and good and uh, I think she would be one of the persons who is is keeping these uh, I don't know these fires alive for the future so mm. that's very important but yes and I mean Attila is, is belongs to Attila Andic who is doing the neurobiological aspect it's, I think it's also uh, somebody who has a good actually he just won an ERC grant um, uh, this year so he's a, a starting grant so that's what he will start in um, next year in, in June so this part of the funding for doing more neurobiology is now sort of uh, secure yeah. and which is good uh, but obviously he's a neurobiologist and uh, that's I should still work on the ecological part <laughs> we are in the department so you'll forgive him <laughs> yeah find them but there we have a lot of nice people in the younger generation so I have a very nice uh, postdoc. She's called Judith Abdai. Uh, actually, with Judith, we are working on this uh, dog-robot interaction a lot. And uh, that's, again, uh, you mentioned at the beginning, it's a very fantastic field. Uh, and, and she's very good with publishing a lot. And maybe I, I'm not sure whether I can say it, but probably this is really now a, a discussion with Lina. So we just get a, probably a, a, a contract with a publisher to make a book on on eco robotics uh, so she will be a co-editor on that that partly also involves actually um, animal robot interactions where I really try to actually describe you know what i mentioned at the beginning how ecology and robotics can work together closely she's very talented i also hope that she will be able to you know get larger grants as he, she progressing in that field then, then is, I mean, Claudia Fugazza, who is also working with me now for many years, and you know her also well. And he's, she's the, again, sort of a crazy woman, uh, I might say. <laughs> that, In the nicest possible first, way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's, she's just uh, 24 hours uh, working, 
traveling everywhere in the world. I mean, she's behind, partly behind of this, uh, let's call it uh, on the official way, genius dog project in a sense, where she was collecting those dogs and, and testing them in, in different parts. And, and she went to, to Brazil for, for two, three days to testing this dog uh, to show actually collecting data. And she's very good also, and she has very good ideas as well. So that's what was also particularly like to her that she comes up with very nice ideas and it's, you know, she doesn't stop there. So it's very keen on, on, and she's very rapid. So we call it this from the idea to the publishing, it goes very fast with her. So I really like that attitude. It's, it's really good. And um, she is, uh, yeah, so, and she's sort of, uh, okay, you know, we try to publish everything in nature and we obviously fail with most all of our stuff. We have never managed that. But you know, we try all the time. So the next time, again, okay, let's try, let's do it. And maybe we just get through. So we have some very interesting, and this whole do as I do. I mean, although we started it with Joseph, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, six, 2006, we got the first paper published. Uh, by the way, the manuscript, after the first round of the reviews, we get from the reviewers, I think 14 pages of comments or something like that. It was crazy. Nobody, I mean, they liked it, but they had so many problems with this paper. And then finally we managed to publish it. And then I went to a seminar in Italy and then Claudia who was there just as a dog trainer at that time was so much excited. And, and uh, that now it, it, it actually has developed as a method. I still not understand why people actually don't use it. I mean, it was, it's such a nice way of getting into interaction with dogs, how you can teach your dog. And this is something that all dogs can do. So it's nothing special there. And there are such nice things. And I hear from time to time, you know, that he is doing it with his dog or some others, but far away from clicker training. So compared to how much you hear about, let's say other training methods. So I think she's also has a good chance of, of, of growing in scientific terms and getting better papers. And, you know, so, I mean, we have a relatively good team together and, and Yes, we have sort of established stars or Martha is, is now we started. I think I can say we as a group, but I'm not very much involved in that in the EG as also a new method to actually try to look into the dog brain, how the dog brain is processing um, perceptual information. They established a new field. I mean, it's a tiny field, but it's no research there. The, how dogs sleep, you know, you might not be <laughs> exciting, but you know, what happens in the brain of a dog when it sleeps. And, and it has actually uh, interesting practical applications because maybe dogs who are sleeping well, they might perform better next day. Maybe they need some sleep after they have learned something. So there are a lot of practical implications that are also interesting for, for humans, or we know something about humans that could be used in dogs. So establishing the, the sleeping pattern uh, it's important also for practical reasons, maybe even for clinici clinicians like you could be interesting actually. Yeah. Well, it's so, becoming a big yeah. issue in the welfare field, I think. Yes, sleep, yes. So um, I think you know, uh, maybe even welfare, you could uh, have a lot, everybody's talking about cortisol and, and stress yeah. signals, but maybe, maybe you could also have a measuring of the sleep pattern and find out that actually the dog has a poor welfare and measuring sleep actually is not so complicated. Mm. You put because the dog is at the place and sleeps. Mm. So you might actually be able to have an equipment that can measure it sort of less invasively, even as we do, but we just put some electrodes on the head. So it's totally not invasive, but mm. that's still you have to be there and the owner has to be there. So, I mean, I mean, we have quite a few talented people and, and maybe we can, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that we have a future. Right. <laughs> <Let's>, right. yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's great to hear that, you know, they, they're getting the grants as well, because that is the, that is what maintains yeah. the legacy, isn't it? So let's, let's talk a little bit more about robotics before we finish, I think. Sort of, yeah, I mean, where do you think that's going scientifically? Um, and sort of, what do you think um, are the big questions? Um, but also commercially, where do you think it's well, got application. Yeah, well, there, are, there are two directions of the, of the robotics work. One is to produce uh, better robots for humans. So this is very practical. So if you think about uh, typical robots that might work in a supermarket, they might work in a um, border control, they might work on the streets as robots, what kind of robots they should be and how they should uh, interact, or even some dogs, some sorry, some some robots who are working in hospitals and so on. And then the idea here is, and that's what we call ito robotics, is that we observe a lot of behavior rules in animals, and we talked a lot about attachment. 
And I think this is a perfect example of, of what is interesting because when you talk about attachment and then when you uh, actually ask a dog owner, okay, you know, what is your relationship in the dog or what, what you like in the dog? Usually the answer is, you know, my dog loves me. And then you're asking them, okay, but yeah, that's fine. But what, how do you know it? <laughs> Basically, they, they tell you things that, okay, when I am getting home, they are waiting me in the front of the door. When I'm watching TV, they come to me and, you know, I can pet them. And then, you know, and that sort of thing. And then if you think about this, you know, my robots can love you as well. And they don't believe it, but no. <laughs> you know, I, just, I just would program the similar behavior. It's not complicated to make a robot waiting in front of the door when you are coming home. So this is one very simple issue. So actually, these are the tricks that, I think well, we call it tricks, but but basically to figure out what kind of skills a robot might have, and they should be very basic. I'm not fan of very complicated. They don't need to talk. They just have to have very simple emotions. Actually, by showing these behaviors, they also signal some emotion. I mean, if you go to a need robot, big eyes, you need those big yeah, eyes. But, you know, <laughs> it's easy. I mean, if you go to a robot, approach it, and the robot would go back towards. Yeah. Just the robot, nothing else happens. You immediately have the idea. Maybe, you know, he doesn't like me or he mm. has shown some fear. No fear is just, you know, moving back a few centimeters. And I think this is where we could really make it. So let's say you have people at the workplace. Some people might like the robot, others not. And they would say things, you know, that you know, I don't like robots. Others say, oh, I love the robot. But the robot can just listen to this and then learn that, you know, I won't approach that person so close because he doesn't like me. So there should not be any conflict. And I would actually approach that person because he actually likes me. So, and there's not, the technology is there and we wouldn't make upset those people who don't like them. I mean, it would make happy those people who like them. So this is, I think a very application, very much close to the application, what we try to do. But for that, I think you need ethologists because the engineers, how much I love them, they don't have really have these ideas. That's what they know is how to program and how to build stuff, which is very important, obviously. <laughs> so, so that we should not deny that. And so that is one aspect of the robotics. Now, the other is what is from the, the, the dog robot interaction. That's also exciting because there the question is, um, I mean, from my perspective at least, what the dogs are understanding from the zoo server, how they see us, what, uh, what are we asked for them, what kind of living beings. And, um, and then the question is, um, when the dogs have a lot of experience with humans as they're interacting, now inter you introduce to them a robot that looks like basically like a, a typical object, anything that is moving. Now, so it's not like a dog-like robot, it's, it's just a very simple, like a Hoover or whatever, a Roomba, for example. Then if this Roomba, let's talk about the Roomba robot, which is this uh, cleaning robot. So if this robot behaves, and this is the key thing, like a human would, so it's helping, okay. The ball is, un is rolling out under the, the shelves. The, robot, the dogs can't get to it. This robot would actually help to get out the ball and it helps the robot or, or the, sorry, the dog various ways, then would the dogs try uh, to show or, or, or start to show social behavior towards this robot? And if they do it, you know, how you can manage this relationship? We don't really want to, ex uh, because there is this accusation that we want to replace the owner. No. And actually tell the owners that, that this is now a competition, so it's competi competition, you know, that you want to be the owner. So it's another thing is kinder <laughs> then it, you might switch the dog might switch and and uh, attribute ownership to the robot but in, in seriously so we could actually have a third person or just another social being that is giving the dog some sort of fun some sort of interaction but from a scientific perspective that's really interesting you know how you should build a robot that makes the dog interested and and makes it possible for the dog to establish a relationship. And this is, has another is interesting because if you are testing uh, robots with people, it's very difficult because people have a lot of mm. uh, you know, knowledge about it. Yeah. They have seen a lot of films, you know, all that stuff. And it always is in the people's mind. You can't get rid of it. But for the dog, this is a totally nice experiment because the dogs will show you if they don't like the robot, then they will just ignore it and don't care. And you, know, you can't pay the money for, being uh, interacting happily with the robot. So, so I think this is a, a really interesting. And that all together, how you build a robot, I think at the long run would teach us 
how you might, and this is important, the might part is important, how you might put together a, a, another mind, um, which is not an animal, could be an animal, although it could be a human. So I think this, this teaches us a lot how you should control, what are the important bits, how you, what you should perceive, what is not important in perception and so on. So this is where we really think that it's a huge perspective, and but I'm still in a, in a process of convincing uh, grant organizations that they should support that yeah. because they don't see it always like this. So, but it's really, I think, a very exciting uh, project. Yeah, so Anna Wilkinson at, at my work, she's you know, she started doing some of this work with the bearded dragons. And the nice mm -hmm. thing about the bearded dragons is they do move like a robot. Okay, yes, yes, that's all the way they move, and and yeah, you could you could build a robotic bearded dragon and you can tease out one particular signal and as you say if you do it with people or you do it with animals you you can't get that reliability but you can start to tease out the individual um effects you know in order to try and work out what is going on um and i mean one of the things that you know it's something i i, I keep returning to again and again and it's partly again from a clinical point of view is at what point and does a dog go from classifying something as being a social stimulus you know that key point because as soon as you say something is part of the social world rather than the physical world you apply completely different rules to it and yes. you know the, the example i often talk to the students about are those uh, vacuum cleaners henry you know <laughs> with, the, with the face on and the yeah. big trunk and whatever and i i'm personally i you know i think you know some dogs you, you look at their reactions to vacuum cleaners and some dogs completely ignore them and they just sort of they're just an inconvenience that makes a loud noise every once in a while other dogs are interacting with them as if you know they are the devil incarnate that's appeared in their house <laughs> you know like growling and snarling and they'll attack it and all sorts and clearly you know they are treating it as an animated social entity and you're just thinking so what cues are they using? And yeah, you know, there, there are elements of facial and probably having a Henry vacuum cleaner is not great, but you know, it can be an old fashioned Hoover and still they will go with it. Um, and you know, my late mum, you know, one of her old dogs, um, if, if it just saw the vacuum cleaner, you know, it was just, well, mm -hmm. it was, as soon as you switched it on and moved it, it would absolutely it would just jump on it and attack it. Um, this dog would never attack anything else in its life. And you just think, so something there. And it's that, you know, in, in humans, it's of one of the things we do is if somebody is something, yeah, as you say, moves a little bit like either a human or the, follows the rules of movement we would expect of an animal, we immediately start to impute that it's got a mind as well and, and that sort of thing. You know, we're drawn into that in the same way as big eyes, we suddenly sort of think, oh, it's cute, you know? <laughs> and, and, um, and it, it, you know, I'd, I'd love to tr sort of try and get at the heart of, yeah, what are the really big key, because again, people might not realize that we, uh, you know, we use very simple stimulus characteristics to make sweeping generalizations. We've both worked on biological motion, which, you know, yeah, you have the dots moving on the sense. screen and, you know, and, and you say, well, that's a person walking towards you or whatever. And, and, and the dogs respond in a similar way. And, you know, we found that if the if it was a, a dog that had social problems, it was much more likely to attend to all directions of movement of the humans, whereas the, the, the dogs which were sort of pretty chilled about life only really responded to the biological motion. And I say, there's no reason to think that's a human. It's just a series of dots, but our brain takes simple cues. And as I said, yeah, clearly there are those sorts of things, but vacuum cleaners don't move like humans <laughs> what is it <laughs> i don't know yeah but i think that also what you, because you mentioned individual differences so i think there are really individual differences and and that's again an interesting question because maybe some dogs uh, have more insight or are more more interested more interested in interpreting the world in a social terms and that's also what you mentioned with the experiment for microsoft where you had these two groups of people that could also be that you have mm. these types of dogs actually, and we had also some impressions, we never really tested that, that some, because when we are, I'm talking about robots for dogs, then we have basically remote control little cars. And some dogs are, I mean, most of dogs, they react to it, 
but really some dogs are really excited. They want to play with it. They, they show a play ball. They throw the ball to the to this car and try to interact. So I think, for example, that would be not, actually we were thinking about this, that maybe this could be a test for testing for more social dogs who actually might be performing better in, let's say, in, in therapy, uh, that would be more, in, more happy to actually be uh, working there compared to other dogs for whom the word is not so uh, different. So I'm just wondering, you mentioned Claudia Fugaz's uh, stuff, the, the Do As I Do. And again, I'll, I'll put the link up for those that don't know about the Do As I Do. And I remember, you know, you came and stayed with us and we did that weekend where we had a, um, you know, a group of people who trained. And I just, one and we we had loads of people drop out and it was interesting because a lot of people suddenly dropped out at the last minute and you're thinking mm, yeah maybe they're not but um but given claudia's experience and, and i ought to do one of these with her i don't, as I don't know her that well but um i'm, I'm sure she'd um it'd be, it'd be sure nice to be happy to do that yeah too. so um but i'm just wondering from her experience i mean is she finding there's a population of dogs that just aren't getting it does, does she have to well, I mean, it, it, the problem, I mean, is that as with all training, I mean, there are some slower learners mm -hmm. and fast learners. So it's not, we don't, in this case, we are convinced that in principle, dogs can do it. It always also depends, as you know, on the trainer or the mm -hmm. owner. But I think this idea of repeating actions, uh, you know, based on the, the person's behavior, I think this is uh, for all dogs okay. So that's why I was saying that, I mean, it's, for example, we don't really know whether puppies can do it and when is the age when they are mm. starting to perform. But what I always say to the dog owners that just try it out and do it because you will have a lot of fun. And it's much easier to teach the dog things afterwards if they know this skill uh, rather than using other methods. I mean, we have the papers, you can also link those, which is really yeah. interesting. And we really managed to compare dogs that were professional in clicker training with dogs who are professional in the do as I do and you can see the difference. So I think it's really a nice, nice method. But yeah. here I don't really think that this is a very special talent that some. Yeah, and I just wondered how much it might depend on that sort of that social element. But from what you're saying, it, it really doesn't. Well, maybe I mean obviously quantitative differences you could find. Mm. So we never really tried out whether mm. you know one dog might be much, and we have individual variation. Uh, Claudia had, I mean, we had, I think, four or five papers on this, mm. but we never, we, one individual is usually used for one p type of data and not really repeatedly uh, mm. tested. This could be done. The problem yeah. is our list for, you know, what you want to do is much, much longer than <laughs> the life of, I don't know, <laughs> yeah, old I, people I, hungry. <laughs> so <laughs> it's impossible. To but I'm sure this. she's got a big network of people who want to do do as I do. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's giving seminar everywhere. Yeah. And I think uh, basically if people visiting this uh, weekend seminar, after that, you can really do it. So yeah. it's basically training the people rather than the dogs. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's... But they were the they were the things I had on my list. I don't know whether you've got anything you wanted to chat about. But I've, oh, I mean, I've, I've, I've had, had a great I evening. At least I just was happy to answer everything what you were saying, and I'm still, you know, like we could talk much longer. I'm, yeah, I, well, I, I've run out of wine. I don't know about you. Okay. I've, been, I've been listening and drinking. I, I did the talking, but and more. But anyway, no. I mean, thank you very much. It was really great, and right. I enjoyed it. And it was a good occasion to talk to you again. Uh, it's uh, lovely to me, see you. Yeah, yeah, because really it was a difficult times, and uh, there are no conferences to go to. Even the <laughs> Canine Science Forum has to be postponed. Yeah. So maybe yeah. this year we or no, well, next year we could have it. Let's see. Yeah, but well, uh, I also trying to cut back on actually giving seminars <laughs> and using uh, the web for some of these. But I've, let's see. I've done the same as well. And in, it was strange because back in 2019, I said, right, I don't want to travel much in 2020. Now you've got to be careful what you hope for, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. but I just sort of thought, I just want to have a bit more time at home. And um, yeah, I hadn't quite anticipated it being so much at home. And, uh, but I said, I love doing these because they are a chance to just catch up and, um, oh, and also to nice. say thank you to people. And, you know, you've always been really generous in everything, uh, you know, and sharing ideas, etc. And I think, you know, that's one of the other things where I think is really nice about this is that people get to see, you know, science, you know, 
scientists are not all cutthroat and whatever. And I, I hear some absolute horror stories from colleagues, you know, oh, the places yeah. they work. And you just think, oh, God, how do you work in that environment? Um, and there's lots of nice people out there. And, you know, you're one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, you too. And I mean, I mean, um, yes, we should also really think about how to, I mean, get together at least in scientifically and maybe. Mm. But so, if you want to train dogs for the fMRI, <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe may we ought to start to rethink about trying to see if we can. Yeah. Um, do yes, but especially if there would be grants uh, uh, to you know to apply together at the European level. I mean, uh, it's just I couldn't really find any. But uh, let's see. Well, one of the latest things at Lincoln is we've now got a medical school. Um, oh, okay. And they're just finishing off the building, so they may be more than interested. But whether or not they'll yeah. let us go anywhere near with dogs, I don't know. But if, mm. I can, if if they employ a neurologist who likes dogs, then maybe <laughs> I can get. Uh, uh, actually, to then do you have uh, somebody around, or you know, who actually has has not won a big grant recently, but he can document or she that they were just not getting it. So basically, you know, mm. last round or just feel way below the level yeah. who has an own research group as well. Because in Hungary, we will now have a, uh, actually we have already a grant system. It's a lot of money, maybe not, I mean, for us, it's a lot of money for those people might be uh, average money to come to Hungary where they could apply. Uh, so for example, just to give an example. So um, if you are dropping out from the second round of the ERC, then uh, you are actually eligible to, to apply. Uh, and then and it could be a foreigner, so we don't have to be. I mean, basically, the government is looking for Hungarians or Hungarians who are working abroad, but we are also looking for actually real foreigners that they should come to Hungary, do research here, and improve the, you know, the oh, wow. uh, research environment. So if you know about any, anybody, then I mean, yeah, I'm happy to help. I mean, in yeah. the logistic yeah. at least. To, yeah. No, well, I, I, well, I, I do know colleagues, whether or not. Um, well, no, I want to lose them is another story, but no, well, I, okay. I, <laughs> I'm telling you to not, I don't know. I, I wouldn't yeah. hold that. It's most important that somebody, as I said, they have the opportunity and, um, you know, and yeah. a, a, it'd yeah. be a great place for them. So I, um, I will mention it to a couple of people that I know. And yeah, um, thank you. I was just, I just learned yeah. it today. So it was yeah. just really very new information. <laughs> yeah, you, you never know. You never know. Yeah. But, okay. um, but it's been lovely to see you. And I know you've got a third edition of your book to get on with because yeah, that's OUP asked me to, so should there be a third edition? Yes, don't ask stupid questions. <laughs> but, but I mean, it, I mean, the field is changing so quickly. Yeah, um, that's true. And um, so when do you think that will be done by? I mean, I got just the, the contract and uh, they suggested latest, it should be out by, no, I should finish the manuscript the 22 summer, which are very generous okay, because, yeah. and so I, I well, I was thinking about end of 21, but now they suggested 22 some. <laughs> I would say, yes, that's okay, fine. That's, okay. That's fine. Only. Just leave yeah, the I'm chapters, leave some of the but, chapters till the last minute because they will change so much. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe you have also commented on it. I don't know who was, I got very good comments back, but the problem is really, I want to reorganize it yeah. really significantly. So, and that uh, I would need, you know, time and concentration. Uh, because the problem is obviously what you put in and what you leave out. So because it can't be, I maybe it could be a little bit bigger, but it's already quite quite mm. long. Yeah. So for sure, I can, I will have to leave out chapters. But uh, there's so much new, and yeah. Um, yeah. it's difficult. And uh, oh, just yeah, but just tell them it. to keep the second edition in print and just do a. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the idea is that they would put some chapters of the second edition uh, online. Right. So the idea would be that you can actually also download those uh, those chapters for free or I don't know yeah. what. And then basically that, so you are basically putting together this, I mean, you can buy the book, but you can also have the whole chapters, which I might just change a little bit or just update it. I don't know how much time yeah. I would have. Because no. this book, you know, having, I like books, but you know, it is also something that slowly go, goes out of fashion <laughs> to have a as you can probably see i like books too and i've got yeah, another, I, I i've got see, another yes, wall very, very nice yeah this used to be I our remember. dining room and yeah i was i think i was in that room <laughs> yeah you were yeah. so what yeah. what happened was um my wife said she wanted a new floor so i laid a new floor we moved the dining room table into the other room and she said oh i okay. quite like the dining room table in that room i said well, okay I just laid you a new floor and she said well, why don't you make that into your study? So I've now got the biggest room in the house. 
Well, that's nice. <laughs> and, um, I did a tutorial with my students and one of them sort of said, have you read all those books? I sort of, yes, and I've got another wall of them. I've read pretty much all of them at some point. But, um, yeah, but don't and, ask me what is in the, the books. No, I can't remember. That's the, I mean, I, when, I, when I was at school, um, I had a great biology teacher and he taught me to scan read. Um, oh, okay. And it was, it was fantastic. And yeah. Um, but I mean, but you I, as a vet, you probably had to learn a lot anyway, no? I yeah. mean, I, that was the one of the, yeah. But it was oh, the, the, class, the thing yeah, about anatomy. the scan reading is you can find you, you remember where everything is. So you think, oh, I know it's in that book and you can picture where it is in the, the book. So you can mm -hmm. quickly get to the page and then think, right, OK, now I can read it. Um, mm -hmm. but anyway, that's anyway. one of those okay. things. OK, good. good to see you um, okay. and we'll catch up again soon. Um, and. I'd, you know, watch us tomorrow afternoon. Watch the videos of the genius dog. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So we'll get the link up there. Um, we'll get this edited as soon as we can. This is sort of partly going to be people's Christmas present from me um, okay, that they you. get to listen to you. So thanks a lot for doing this. And I should point out, you're the first person from outside North America that I've chatted to oh, on this podcast. So there we go. There's another first for you. Right. I don't expect okay. to see that thank on your you. CV. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Daniel. Okay. Okay, take care.